You're listening to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast, episode number 65. Hey guys, happy Monday. So I have a very special, cool episode to share with you guys this week. So this week I had Serena come on the podcast and Serena is a stay-at-home mom of two boys. And after her son received a liver transplant at the age of five months old, Serena has been an active advocate for organ donation. She loves to share his story as a way to bring awareness to organ donation and to honor his selfless donor and their family. So after battling years of infertility due to PCOS, Serena and her husband welcomed their son Ezra into the world. Her birth was all natural and everything that she wanted it to be, but the bliss soon wore off as they started to notice that he started to get these weird red bumps all over his body. Their doctors warned that there could be some on in, on his internal organs. So one day after many, many ultrasounds, they found a bunch on his liver, which was super scary, obviously. And this was just the start of Ezra's whole story into getting his liver transplant. So without further ado, let's get into this week's episode all about Ezra. You're listening to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast, where we firmly believe in the power of education when it comes to giving birth. Tune in each week as we dive into pregnancy-related topics, expert interviews, and a variety of birth stories. As a reminder, anything you hear on this podcast is not medical advice. Please see mommylabornurse.com slash disclaimer for more details. And now, here's your host, educator, registered nurse, and fellow mom, Liesl Teen. Hi, Serena. Welcome to the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast. Thank you so much for being here today. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah. I know we chatted a little bit on Instagram, but can you start by telling our listeners a little bit about yourself and your family, where you're from, what you like to do on weekends, all that good stuff? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I am from Kansas. I'm. Um, we have a family of four, and my husband and I Um, And then my oldest son is Anthony and he is seven years old. And then my youngest son is Ezra and he is one. He just turned one in September. Um, Yeah. Yeah. I'm a stay at home mom. So I get to do all of the fun things here around the house. (laughs) Hey, it's, it's fun, but it's, it's a, that is a full-time job. Oh, (laughs) it is. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Take lots, takes lots of thought and lots of work. Yes. I, I, I I understand. (laughs) All (laughs) right. So today guys, we, we were just chatting before the episode and this is a little bit different kind of episode than what we're used to, um, in terms of birth stories. Serena, if you want to start off with Mm -hmm. Ezra and his birth and how that went, and then we're actually going to talk more, um, about the aftermath and kind of what happened after with Ezra. So if you want to start, um, I guess maybe, maybe just, you know, kind of synopsis of his birth and then we can start talking about everything else. Yes. Um, So I had a a pretty healthy pregnancy. Um, I had PCOS, so Mm -hmm. it was a struggle trying to um, conceive. It took us about three years. So we were very, very excited um, once we found out that we were going to have little Ezra. Yeah. Um, And so uh, with my first, I had, um, I wasn't really educated on on giving birth I was like okay I'll just go to the hospital and I'll just give birth the nurses will tell me what to do it'll be Mm -hmm. easy peasy Mm -hmm. um I'll get the epidural it'll all be good and I realized it's not like that um I did not I did not enjoy uh I guess the way I went about it with my first so uh with my second I was all about um educating myself. I went to uh, a class done by a doula here at our hospital. Nice. Um, and yeah, and I was able to uh, kind of have a, a better birth experience. Um, I gave birth to Ezra, uh, all natural <laughs> nice. on uh, September 13th. And um, yeah, it was great. It was a really uh, short birth. I was in labor for about three hours and I pushed for 10 minutes and he was here. So yeah, it was a very different story. Yeah. Briefly tell me, since you you use the word compare. So can you tell me a little bit about that first 
birth, like length, like time length and sure. kind of what happened just, so, just so I, kn- just so, you know, we can kind of see the, the comparison. Yeah. Um, well with my first, um, I was induced, I was two mm-hmm. weeks over. Um, and so I got the, uh, Pitocin of course, and mm-hmm. I was in labor for 16 hours, I mm-hmm. believe. Um, I got the epidural and I, my body just didn't react to it well. My oh. blood pressure dropped and it just mm-hmm. wasn't a good experience. Um, and then, of course, with the Pitocin, that made contractions just awful. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was actually, you know, funny with my second, um, I was laboring at home for a long time because I was just like telling my husband, like, these aren't nearly as bad as I remember them. Mm -hmm. I can, I can labor it out at home longer. And then, um, by the time I got to the hospital, I was a nine. So yeah. So they were like, um, okay, it's, it's time. Um, so yeah, Yeah. it was just a a big difference, um, in comparing the contraction. I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's a huge difference. Well, okay. Let's transition now and talk more about Ezra. So something kind of significant after uh, happened right after he was born. So can you kind of transition there and what you kind of started to notice about him? Sure. Um, so, uh, of course, as, as soon as he was born, they placed him on me and, um, I noticed he had a lot of, they looked like freckles, like very faded Mm. freckles all over him. Um, and so the nurses took him uh, under the lamp just to get a better look. And they were definitely all very confused. They said that they looked like something called hemangiomas, mm-hmm. um, which are like kind of like a little benign tumor made up of a bunch of blood vessels. Mm-hmm. Uh, and usually a baby can can have a couple of them, but you just don't see them all over the body very often. Mm-hmm. Um, so they were definitely, uh, kind of puzzled by it. Um, and then the pediatrician came in, um, not too long after and, and confirmed that he was pretty sure that they were, uh, the hemangiomas. Mm -hmm. And at this time they did, they did just look like very faded red freckles is all I could explain. Like you could barely notice it unless you were really looking. Um, but I mean, they were, all over his body. Um, and so the pediatrician just kind of warned us that, um, sometimes when a baby has, you know, more than like two, uh, they can kind of, um, present on on the internal organs. So Mm -hmm. he wanted to get an ultrasound done the next day. Um, and you know, he kind of assured us that hemangiomas are fairly, um, just not something really to worry about typically. Yeah. Um, so we did that. Uh, he got an ultrasound done at barely 12 hours old. Um, Aww. and he, uh, he did, they did find, um, quite a few on his liver. They checked mm-hmm. his brain and his kidneys, you know, all of the, the big internal organs and, mm-hmm. um, you know, luckily they were just on his, his liver. Um, so that's kind of how it went in the hospital, um, as soon as he was born. Okay. And was he showing any other signs and symptoms? Like, was he on oxygen or was he like, were there, was there anything else like significant or did he just kind of look like a normal baby and he just had these weird red bumps on him? Um, he was a bigger baby, so he was struggling with low blood sugars a little bit as well. Um, but we were able to kind of manage that. He didn't need to go into the NICU or anything like that for those. Um, but yeah, besides that, he just, at that time, he looked like a very, uh, normal baby. Um, and so our next step was, um, we got referred to our closest children's hospital. Mm -hmm. Uh, so I live in Kansas and then the closest one to us is in Missouri, but it's only about an hour drive uh, from Mm -hmm. us. Um, And so we went there. I think he was four days old. I had just, uh, you know, I, we got discharged at two days old and, uh, we went to the hospital. Um, we met with 
a dermatologist for the hemangiomas, Mm -hmm. um, cardiologist, a surgeon, and the liver care center up there. Um, It was a full day of scans and appointments and Mm -hmm. blood work. Um, And at at that age, you know, they're eating pretty constantly. Uh, But it's hard because we would have to not feed him so he could get the ultrasounds done. I think it was like four hours, had to fast for four hours. Um, Interesting. Yeah. So that was very, that was a struggle with a a breastfeeding newborn who was nursing every two hours. I was just going to ask if you went the breastfeeding route or if you just started to pump or if you were just like, I'm going to scrap this breastfeeding thing and we're just going to try and do formula or kind of your thoughts, you know, revolving um, that. So I was pretty adamant about breastfeeding um, and kind of the, you know, with, as we kind of get into the story more, he did end up having issues with his liver Mm -hmm. Um, and with children who have um, issues with their liver, it takes a lot of effort for them to gain weight. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I would breastfeed and then I ended up pumping that way uh, we could fortify his breast milk Mm -hmm. with formula and kind of up those calories. Mm -hmm. Um, But unfortunately, you know, I struggled a lot not being able to bring him, you know, to me to actually feed. Yeah, My supply dropped a lot, but I kept pumping as long as I possibly could. I think I stopped at about 10 months when he was 10 months. That's Um, quite a long time. (laughs) Yeah. A long time for just pumping. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Well, okay. So let's transition now. You are what, four days old. He's getting tests. So what happened after that? Um, so the liver care center, you know, at that time, his liver numbers weren't elevated really. And they kind of wanted to just take a wait and watch, um, approach. And of course we were okay with that. Um, now the dermatologists were really concerned about the hemangiomas, uh, at that time, it had only been a couple of days and they were starting to get brighter red. Uh, Mm. and the unfortunate thing with hemangiomas, um, the thing that kind of makes them a little bit more scary is they can kind of burst open. The bigger they get, they get really puffy Mm -hmm. and they burst and it's you know, not, not a good situation, painful and can get infected. Um, so they wanted to start him on a medication called, uh, propanol. Mm-hmm. And that is actually, I think that's how you say it. It's a heart medication. Um, but it actually works to help shrink these, um, hemangiomas they found as well. Okay. So, um, the liver care center and dermatology were kind of going back and forth on this. And they decided, you know, he was only a couple days old. Let's wait a little bit um, before starting him on that. So we did, um, you know, we made sure that's why we went to the cardiologist to, to see if he, if it would be okay for him to start that medicine, if he had to. Mm -hmm. Um, And he's never had any uh, heart issues. Thank goodness. So that was, um, that was okay. And, uh, so we would go back every, every week for labs and to meet with the liver care center. And I think it was, uh, when he was three weeks old, we went back and got his labs done and, um, his liver numbers were very elevated. Um, and so they decided again to bring up the propanol and they said, well, let's try it and maybe it will Um, also help shrink those hemangiomas on the liver. Yeah. That's kind of what we thought was causing the the liver to be so stressed out. Um, And so we started that and we had to be admitted for that just because they did want to watch for side effects. Um, Because I think it was like, you know, your blood sugars can drop, blood pressure can drop, that sort of thing. Uh, So. He tolerated it very, very well. Um, the medicine helped his hemangiomas on his skin shrink. Uh, just, I mean, it felt like overnight, but it was um, over the yeah over the next month or so. Um, 
almost all of them started to disappear, which were amazing because there were hundreds of them all over his body. And yeah, I was just going to ask, cause I'm looking at pictures of hemangiomas right now and it looks like they are fi- like when, when a child has them, there's not a whole lot of them. It's like, right. it's like this big, you know, they have like a big collection of them. So you're saying he actually had them all over his body. Yes. He had hundreds of them on the bottom of his feet, on his, you know, hands, his Mm -hmm. torso. Um, Yeah. The dermatology center said they'd never seen that in a baby. That's crazy. Um, And let me ask you this too. Did you have any idea before he was born that he had these? I mean, probably not, right? They can't see anything on ultrasound. Correct. And, you know, I had a fairly healthy pregnancy. So we had the anatomy scan and that was it. (laughs) So we just didn't, yeah, we had no idea. Um, Wow. So he tolerated it very well. Um, and his skin ones disappeared. Um, Mm -hmm. unfortunately his liver ones, they shrunk, but not, not enough. And at that point they weren't even sure it was the hemangiomas really causing Uh all of the liver stress. Um, and so uh, we got admitted again. Uh, he was two months old at this time. Um, and they completed a uh, HIDA scan, which is when they um, inject like a fluid and they check mm-hmm. bile flow mm-hmm. through the liver. Um, and they found that his bile was not flowing out of the liver um, oh. the way it was supposed to. And at this point, you could see, you know, his hemangiomas were gone, but he was very, very yellow. He I was had, just going to ask. Yeah, usually yes. those babies are even at two, yeah, two older. I mean, mm-hmm. we we probably, most babies, mo- not, I won't say most moms, but a lot of babies have just the jaundice when they're born. So you can recognize like a yellow little tiny newborn. But yeah, I've yes. seen a cup, a, a few cases of where they, you know, they're older and it's like a little, little, poor yes. little jaundice yellow baby. They had, you know, he had like the golden yeah. tan skin yeah. and the yellow eyes. Uh, so we were pretty lucky um, because besides the yellow skin and, you know, the yellow eyes, he really wasn't having any, any pain. You know, his yeah. hemangiomas never burst, his liver never caused him any pain that we could tell of. Yeah. Um, it was just the pokes, poke every week. Uh, that's, that was always hard getting yeah. labs done. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's like I was saying about breastfeeding and stuff. At that time, he was really struggling with gaining weight. And so we talked about starting an NG tube mm-hmm. um, just to kind of help him put on that weight. Uh, but we decided not to at that time because he was gaining slowly. It was very slow, but he was gaining. And I just, I I felt like I knew at that time he was going to go through a lot and he was going to have a lot of pokes Mm -hmm. (laughs) uh, for a while. And I just, I wasn't, I didn't feel like it was necessary at that point for the NG tube. And And that's fine. And that's fully within, you, you know, your rights and everything. I mean, that's, that's, I, I feel like a very informed, good decision on your part. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Um, and so, uh, I just kept breastfeeding and, um, that was going as well as it could. And we had weight checks, uh, usually once a week, uh, here where we lived, we didn't have to travel for those. Um, and like I said, he was doing very good. He really had no severe side effects of his liver failing quite yet, except for Mm -hmm. the uh, color of the skin. Mm -hmm. And then um, when he was three months old, we had our first big scare with him. Mm -hmm. Um, He was, he had just woken up from a nap um, and I went to go pick him up and he was very, very sweaty and he was so cold um, and lethargic. Um, So we went to the emergency room and, um, His temperature was 91 degrees and his blood sugars were at 19. Oh, yes. So I think the typical blood sugar is 65 at that age. So 
he was extremely low. I mean, they were they were amazed that he hadn't gone into a coma by the time Arrest. they got him yeah. there. Yeah. Yes, yeah. because he was um, very, very low. So as soon as we got to the ER and they saw his temperature, because I'd taken it at home. Mm-hmm. And I, it kept coming up low, like 96 degrees, 95 Well, yeah, degrees. yeah. If you yeah. had like a normal, you know, yes. thermometer, it doesn't even read that low. Right. And I just kept thinking there has to be something wrong with this. There's no yeah. way he's that cold. Yeah. Um, and so, of course, as soon as we got to the ER, he got his sugar um, uh, in the IV. Mm-hmm. As soon as we got there, um, he got the sugar gel in his mouth. And they put him under a heating lamp. Um, And I think that was, that was one of the scariest moments of our life. As soon as we heard those numbers, uh, we were absolutely terrified because he really hadn't scared us like that yet. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we were there overnight and they got his sugars back up. They got his temperature back up and he was maintaining very well. Um, So they... Uh, we talked to our liver care center and um, they kind of told us, you know, it could be such a wide range of things. It could be his liver failing uh, Mm -hmm. even more because your liver regulates your, your blood sugar and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. It could be um, the medication he's on that propanol that uh, has that side effect sometimes, or it could just be a combination of both. Yeah. So we were like, okay. And they, they halved his propanol, um, dosage in half. Uh, and so they, they told us if it happened again to go ahead and call them. And this time we'll go straight to the children's hospital rather than our local hospital. Yeah. Um, and so then two days later it happened again. Uh, his blood sugars dropped to 39. We had like the oh. little, uh, checker at our house. Um, and so we immediately, they told us, uh, the liver care center told us if his blood sugars drop like that, give him frosting. So we had (sighs) our little, our tub of frosting for him in the fridge. Uh And so we Uh immediately gave him some frosting. Um, my husband started the shower, um, and like heated up, (laughs) turned the bathroom into a sauna. Yeah. You guys are in there. We called the hospital. Uh, to make sure they had a room for us because we knew we would be staying overnight. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so that's what we did. We got him regulated again and we went straight to the hospital. Um, my other son, we dropped off at my grandparent or at his grandparents, my parents. Mm-hmm. Um, and we went to the hospital and um, they again were able to get him back up and they wanted to um, do something. I, I can't remember the official name, but they wanted to s- basically send him into a hypoglycemic episode um, mm-hmm. and do the critical care labs uh, that they needed to do. They had to get him to go into another episode to get those labs to see what was causing um, this. So uh, we waited and waited, and you know, we did the fasting and all sorts of things, but he did, he never went into another episode while we were at the hospital. Of course. Of course Uh, they do that. You know, (laughs) yeah. So we were there for about three days, I believe. Okay. Um, And it, his liver numbers were definitely getting worse. Um, yes. And he wasn't able to go into one of those episodes and, um, so at that point, they talked to us about a liver transplant. Um, and they had actually just lost someone on their team. Um, and so they didn't have a full transplant team at, oh. at the time anymore. It happened like a week before they talked to us about this. Oh, wow. Um, yeah. So they kind of gave us some options of other children's hospitals and hospitals to look at. Um for transplant. And, um, at this time, my, so my husband had just started working, um, for his company and they, uh, of course he didn't have FMLA yet. Cause he had just started. He didn't have, um, you know, the time built up to, to help 
with all this, but he was, um, he had the most amazing boss who let him uh, work from the hospital. My husband works in IT and, you know, who was just so kind and helped us, um, helped us be more flexible because it was definitely very hard with, you know, Ezra in the hospital. Um, by this time it was January, the very end of January and it was flu season. And uh-huh. so, um, they didn't, they only allowed one parent on the floor. Uh, and so my husband and my other son would stay at the Ronald McDonald house. Mm-hmm. Um, uh-huh. and we just kind of switch on and off and anyway. Yeah. So it was a, it was a puzzle to try and figure out all of that. Um, yeah. And I was going to say it's right before COVID. Stopped yes. Too. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so we, uh, got referred to Omaha, which is uh, in Nebraska. Okay. Um, and that is where we went to get his transplant evaluation. Um, and so let's see, I think it was February 11th. Uh, we went up to Omaha for what we thought was just going to be two days. We uh, left my older son at home with my parents. Um, we packed our bags and, you know, we knew we were going to be in the hospital all day, but we're like, we'll, we'll try and we'll try and have some fun. We'll go out to dinner, go to the mall again before COVID. So, um, life was a little bit more normal, um, and just kind of make the best of it. So we headed up there and Omaha is about three hours from where we live. So it wasn't too bad of a drive, but it definitely wasn't close. Yeah. And when we got there, uh, they did labs for him. And they told us uh, that we could not leave. They told us that his numbers were um, dangerously high. Uh, His INR number, which kind of helps with like blood clotting, Mm -hmm. was very high, showing that he just wasn't wasn't clotting. And so they admitted us. Um, He got a vitamin K shot to help um, with that, with his INR number. Mm -hmm. Um, they finished doing his labs for his liver and they found out that his bilirubin was at 30 and Mm. yes, typically, (laughs) yes, typically it's under one. So yeah, yeah, it was extremely high. Um, usually he maintained anywhere from like 12 to 15 was his Mm -hmm. typical bilirubin number. So it had more than doubled. Yeah. Um, and he wasn't showing and any more like lethargic symptoms. And I mean, was his skin, it's just, he had like the skin issues and the yellow mm-hmm. eyes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. And I think, um, dropping and having that medicine really yeah. helped a lot yeah. with making sure he didn't have those episodes again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, they, they told us, um, that we were just going to do the evaluation inpatient and they kind of expedited everything. It was supposed to take two days and it took, I don't know, maybe two hours to get it all done. Um, You know, yeah, you have to do the scans and meet with a psychologist to get evaluated and all sorts of things that you don't really even think of uh, when you need a transplant. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So um, he, they told us that night that he was going to be listed the next day um, and that he was going to be at the very top of the list. Um, he was listed status 1A and um, they let us know that it was very emergent because my husband and I were, I think we were in denial. We were like, oh, no, 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 no. You know, we mm-hmm. are just coming here to get evaluated. Mm-hmm. We're supposed mm-hmm. to be able to go back home and wait for a transplant there, you know, and they, I think we were just very caught off guard. We did not expect it to be like that, um, to be so rushed. And, you know, they, they told us that he couldn't make it a couple more days without a oh, liver at that point. Oh, that is and terrifying. So, yes. Yes, it was. And so, and also we didn't know this team, you know, we had. Yeah a really strong relationship with our other liver care team. And now we have a new one that we just met that wants to, you know, put him, give him a transplant right away. And we 
at that time were just so shocked and scared and we just hadn't developed that level of trust with them yet. Um, And it it was very hard to accept, but we were like, okay, you know, as soon as they said this, as soon as they said that, we're like, okay, let's, let's get him listed. Yeah. Um, So he was listed the next day and we, um, uh, we were lucky because that hospital uh, also did living donation. Not every hospital um, has oh. like a donation program. So they um, they told us if we had anyone in our family that wanted to um, be considered that we could give them their information. So we put it out. You know, we told our family. We put it on social media. Mm-hmm. Um, it got shared. Uh, by a nonprofit down there um, on their social media um, that he was looking for a donor. And um, my dad was the first in line to be worked up because he was the same blood type. Uh Um, Yes. But my dad is a very tall man. He is six, four. And of course at this time, Ezra just turned five months old the day he was listed. Yeah. Um, So that didn't quite work out. So we put it put it back out there. Um, I think the qualifications were, they had to be under 50, same, you know, same blood type or an O, uh-huh. um, a certain BMI, they had to be under five, five, uh, just like all of these super specific things because he was a baby. And so they needed yeah, someone. I didn't even smaller. think about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, a lot of sense. Yes. To me, I think, you know, with, liver donation they take a part of your liver right so i'm like right. how could just a part of but you know it's just a little just take a smaller part then right. you know right. so right. but of course that's just that's just the way our minds work when yeah. you know <laughs> i don't, don't have the medical experience um but yeah uh so the next day they got his um central line in and um that was honestly such a godsend because he had been poked every day almost for his whole life. And, um, Poor baby. yes. And the fact that they could now, you know, give him his IVs, give him his, you know, take blood from there and not have to poke him every time, yeah. um, was just so amazing. Yeah. And, uh, so that day went by and we didn't have a donor. There were hundreds of people calling in to get evaluated for living donation. Um, we were so incredibly super blessed by all of our family and friends and people we didn't even know who were calling and trying to see if they would be a match for him. Yeah. And uh, then the day came. Uh, let's see. It was two days, two days after he got listed um, my Yay. husband, yes, my husband had stayed the night at the hospital with him. And, um, I, I came to kind of relieve him, uh, at that time. Um, they didn't have flu precautions at that hospital. So my other son could stay in the room with us. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I sent my husband to the Ronald McDonald house to go sleep. And it was just me and the two boys in the hospital room. And a phone rang that was in the hospital room that I didn't even know existed. And uh, I remember looking at it thinking, like, is the nurse supposed to get that? Like, do you answer that? (laughs) But I went and I answered it. And they told us, you know, okay, we have a liver for him. Um, And I just remember being so just shocked. Just I, I honestly, it was hard to focus on anything else she was saying. Um, Yeah explained everything. And, uh, I was like, okay. And, um, I hung up with her and I called my husband and he was like, should I, should I just come back over? And I was like, no, I think it's probably going to be a while. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, my family started to come up again, this was the middle of February. So right before, Mm -hmm. um, COVID and there wasn't restrictions. Um, my parents, my couple of my aunts, uh, Mark, my husband has a big family. So some of his siblings came up all to, to wait with us and, and, you know, keep, uh, keep our minds busy during surgery. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and so we got the call at 11 AM that he was going to get a liver. Um, and he didn't go into surgery until 9 AM the next day. 
And I remember mm-hmm. when, um, I remember waiting because it's just, it's a lot of waiting in those hours. Everything seems to move so slow. And uh, so many family and friends were were reaching out and, you know, has it started? When's it going to get started? Blah, blah, blah. And I remember um, my husband and I at the end of the night were in the, in the room with Ezra and my oldest was uh, with my parents. And uh, I remember feeling like it's okay. Like I, I didn't mind waiting because I knew that somewhere, somewhere in the country, we don't know where they're from or we don't know who our donor family is. Um, We do know that it was a baby, but um, somewhere there was a family who was getting their last moments with their child um, who was, you know, saying all of their goodbyes and, you know, getting those last those last kisses and those last hugs and snuggles and, and moments. And I remember thinking and telling my husband, you know, these last moments that they are having with their child is going to give us so many first moments with ours. Yeah. Oh, yes. It's so, it's so hard to, to think about and it's so sad, but it's just, it's so, um, it's such a selfless thing that Mm -hmm. so many people do and, and uh, it truly changes lives. You know, it truly yeah. is one of the most selfless gifts that you can give anyone. And I think it's even harder when it's you making the decision for your child. You know, when we sign up mm-hmm. for organ donation, um, it's us. But to know that there is a family out there that had to make that choice about their child and decided that they wanted their child to go on and save other Mm -hmm. children Mm -hmm. is just, I mean, it's amazing. And I think it's going to help if there's people listening um, who are on the other end, you know, I'm sure a lot of people who listen to this episode will, will, um, it will resonate with them because maybe they have a similar situation as you, but maybe there are also people who are listening who have been in that situation and had a baby like that where mm-hmm. they passed and they did organ, um, organ, you know, don- donations afterwards. So I'm sure your story probably gives those people a lot of maybe peace. Uh, peace is probably the right word, but just a lot of, um, <laughs> you know, you don't, you don't hear, I'm sure, I'm sure you don't hear about that, you know? Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, The gratefulness. It's very, it's, it's an overwhelming sense of gratefulness. And honestly, um, in our situation, it's almost like, and with a lot of other uh, transplant um, recipient moms, like it's almost like you, you grieve with that family, you know, on, Mm -hmm. on holidays that, baby and that family is one of the first things on my mind. Yeah, I'm Um, sure. I'm sure. Yeah. It's a, it's a, it's a very um, humbling thing. Gosh. Um, Yeah. Yes. So yeah, he got um, his liver transplant at 9am that morning. Mm -hmm. Uh, And like I said, we had a packed waiting room. Um, it definitely kept our minds busy. It was a six hour long surgery and it was so nice to just have all of our, yeah. our family there with us. Um, and surgery went flawlessly. He did so good. Um, good. yes. And we went, uh, of course he was in the ICU for afterwards. Um, and he did so good in, in recovery. Um, it's definitely a scary thing. Uh, something that I don't think we were prepared for those first few days mm-hmm. post transplant. Um, you know, they're sedated the whole time and, uh, they have the, the ventilator and it is very, a scary, scary thing. And you never, you never want to leave them because sometimes he'd kind of open his eye and, and look mm-hmm. over at you and you just don't want to miss those moments almost. I know. And, uh, and they look so scary when they're hooked up yes. to all those things too. They don't even look like your child. Yeah. No, they don't. And yeah. uh, he was so swollen, uh, which is pretty common for yeah. transplant patients. So yeah. 
Um, I think he went up like two diaper sizes in that time. Aww. Yes. Um, but, you know, he ended up doing really amazingly. Um, we got out of the, the PICU and uh, went up to the general peds floor. Um, we were there for about about three weeks more. Um, he did have a small bout of acute rejection. Okay. Um, so what they do is they, you know, they take a little biopsy of the liver to confirm that's what it was. And, uh, usually when it's caught so early, um, he, he was just given steroids and that kind of helped, okay. um, okay. suppress his immune system a little bit more. Um, and yeah, he, he rocked it and, you know, he had a little bit of roid rage, but it was yeah. okay. Yeah. Yes. Um, and, uh, thank God we have not had another out of rejections since then he's 10 months post transplant now so yes um he has honestly rocked it so much um he is just such a healthy little boy now um yes it's uh it it was definitely scary because as soon as he got discharged it was mid-march and in mid-march that's when COVID hit. So yeah, I was just going to ask, I want to like hear your thoughts on the whole COVID situation and having a child that's immunocompromised from having a transplant and like just what comes with that and, and your thought and just everything (laughs) in terms of that. Cause that's a lot. Yes. So we don't, I mean, we don't even know what normal life looks like with an immunocompromised child. Right. Uh, And we, so we got discharged and we had to stay at the Ronald McDonald house. Um, and we would have a nurse come and do labs from, from the house. Okay. And it was so scary because, you know, the Ronald McDonald house is such an amazing house, but it is a communal living space. And yeah. it's, it's scary to have to, you know, you keep hearing at this time, no one really knew much about COVID. COVID, mm-hmm. you just knew you didn't want to get it. Right. <laughs> and here I was with, you know, this immunocompromised child fresh out of transplant and um, living in a communal living space. And uh, so we talked to his liver care uh, team at the hospital and they said, you know, he's doing great. Just go home and be safe and get labs done every week. So yeah. that is what we've been doing. We take all of the precautions so seriously. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, yes, we, uh, he goes once a week still, um, actually now it's every other week, uh, to get his labs done at the hospital. Um, but besides that, he does not go anywhere in public. Um, we, you know, we go outside places and go on hikes and do fun stuff like Mm -hmm. that. Um, you, you know, there are definitely some good creative options that I feel everyone has come up with to stay safe. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> yes. um, but yeah, we take his precautions very seriously. Um, I, I told my husband and I tell my family, you know, I've seen him on a ventilator yeah. and I don't ever intend to see him on one again. No, please. No. But yeah. Yes. I think that's a good goal. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, Serena, this was such an amazing story. I just have one last question. So you said he is, so if he's 10 months post, so how old is he now? Like a year and some change? He is, yep, 15 months. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. So what is life like today? You said that you go once a week to the hospital to get his labs drawn, but is he Mm -hmm. on any medications or is he, um, I mean, does, does he look and act like a normal kiddo or? Um, so he is, he, when he was uh, originally discharged, he was on 15 medications. He's now dropped to um, six medications, okay. which is awesome. Um, yeah. One of those he will take for the rest of his life. That's the immunosuppressant. Right. All right. And uh, yeah, he acts like a normal one-year-old. He's a, he's our little wild child. He uh-huh. loves to be daring and do lots of naughty things he's not supposed to do. <laughs> um, he is just so full of life and he's so sweet. Um, 
if you don't see his scar on his belly, that you would never know yeah. of his story. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. Yeah. He is wow. absolutely amazing. So, <laughs> Well, that is amazing. Thank you so much, Serena, for coming on and sharing Ezra's story. I think it's going to help a lot of people who are, you know, maybe in a similar situation, maybe not a liver situation, but having a child with medical issues, um, after, you know, a, a young baby right after they're born is something that I think a lot of people... Um, you know, if you're going through that situation, you can resonate with this story. So thank you so, so much for coming on. Yeah. I just wanted to share too. um, if you go on, I believe it's donate life America's, uh, website, you can, um, sign up there to become an organ donor. There are currently 2000 children that are on the transplant list. Um, 25% of those are under five. Uh, and so, yeah, there is such a huge need for organ transplant for people of all ages. Um, you know, 18 people die on the on the transplant list waiting for a transplant every day. So um, I just hope that maybe this could inspire someone who's. Yeah, um, totally. Not I'm, really, on there. I'm on yeah. there right now. I'm on their website right now. And we will uh, leave that website in the show notes page too for anybody who is interested in going there and registering to be a donor. This is perfect. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Serena, again for coming on. Yes. Thank you. Have a good day. You too. All right. So that is it for this episode of the Mommy Labor Nurse Podcast. You probably follow me on Instagram because that's probably where you came from. But if you don't, head over to Instagram and follow me at mommy.labornurse for more. That is certainly where I am most active. I also now have a separate Instagram for just this podcast, so I encourage you to follow my second account at mommylabornurse.podcast as well if you want podcast updates. Again, that is at mommylabornurse.podcast. As always, you guys know that I also have a website where I have tons of articles all about pregnancy, birth, breastfeeding, newborn stuff, and more at www.mommylabornurse.com. I want to hear more from you on how much you love this episode of the podcast or how you think I can improve. So leave me a comment on one of my pictures, send me a DM or send me an email with all the love. All right, guys, I will see you same time, same place next week.